All right, so this is Bible warfare, how to defend your faith. Lesson number two, only the church of Christ saved. So we started our class on Bible warfare, how to defend your faith by listing the rules of engagement last week. Basic rules to help us maintain communication when discussing religious issues with our friends and with our families. A lot of times, you know, there's a, Division and hurt feelings can happen not on account of what is being taught, but on account of the attitude that people have when they're trying to share their faith. So we said there are some kind of basic rules of engagement if we want to maintain communication and, and good relationships you know, with our family and friend, uh, friends uh, if, if we're discussing uh, religious ideas. So rule number one, respect other people's sincerity. Remember that others hold deeply uh, and dearly their views and to disrespect that will cause communication breakdown. You, know, you may disagree with their beliefs, but you mustn't be disagreeable in doing so. It's okay to disagree. We disagree on this particular issue, but uh, if we want to keep the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the door of communication open, we have to be uh, polite, we have to be kind. Um, Second one, stick to the Bible. Your objective is always to understand accurately and then communicate accurately what the Bible says and actually what you believe the Bible says. It's okay to say, I believe that the Bible says. When you say, I believe that the Bible says, what you're saying is, I don't know everything and I, I, I could be mistaken but as far as this point is concerned, I believe that this is what the Bible says. That's okay, that's, that's fine to, to, stay that, to say that. Um, um, not I feel, you know, I feel that. I feel that it's not fair that God should judge people. You know, that, that has no, you don't get anywhere just by comparing feelings. The questions that you've submitted will all be answered in this context. You know, the questions that you've submitted to me uh, for this uh, class, what does the Bible say? Not what does the quote Church of Christ says, and hopefully the Church of Christ and the Bible were saying exactly the same thing. That's what we're shooting for. But uh, our objective is always, as, as members of the church, to accurately convey what the Bible teaches about particular topics. Number three, and be patient, of course. Different people are, um, um, are, at dif are at different points of knowledge and at, uh, and at different points of maturity, spiritual maturity. So don't be in a rush. Take time and take the time necessary to teach and encourage, uh, to share. Uh, the world says, you know, where there's life, there's hope. That's what the world says. What we say is that all things are possible with God. Oh, it's impossible that my uncle would ever you know, come around. You know, it's impossible. Well, maybe it's impossible for you to think that your uncle would come around to believing in the scriptures and so on and so forth. But with God, all things are possible. God opens hearts. And this week I'm just going to ask, I'm going to add one more. Don't get discouraged. Don't be totally destroyed if someone rejects your very best intentions and your clearest teaching. As I said last week, there are many obstacles that keep people from believing the gospel or accepting a more accurate teaching from God's word. Keep trying with others to share your faith and to share the word. Keep loving your friend or your family member, even if they reject the word. In this way, they will have a constant witness of God's love, even if they reject His truth. And in so doing, you will affirm your own faith before the Lord. Sometimes the objective is not for the person you're teaching. Sometimes it's for you. It's for you to learn something in the attempt to teach someone else. Okay, so much for the rules of engagement. Let's get down to questions that you asked last week. Uh, as I say, if you didn't have a chance, we've got some of those cards out. You can write some, some more questions and I will, uh, I'll try to uh, answer those before we finish the entire course. Now I've taught this class before in the past and in these classes the questions that I receive 
you know, they tend to repeat themselves and they fall into four categories. And so this time's no different. The questions that I've gotten from you so far tend to fall into the same categories. So some of your questions are different, but these are the categories that they fall into nevertheless. Uh, some fall into the doctrinal, they're like doctrinal questions. Now these were the type of questions that required an answer based on what the Bible teaches on a specific issue or on a specific practice. And these were subdivided into other categories. Note that the same doctrinal questions were asked in a variety of ways, but they all required the same answer. For example, a lot of people ask why we use music or why we think that the Church of Christ is the only church to go to heaven. When I say why we use music, why we, use, why we don't use instruments of music in our worship. That question comes back all the time. Uh, in evangelism, a lot of questions dealt with evangelism. How do we do it better? How do we approach different individuals? Obviously, someone who has a Hindu background versus someone who has a Roman Catholic background, you, there's a big difference there. The Roman Catholic, well, you can begin with the assumption that they believe in one God. You know, Catholics are monotheists like we are, and they're theists, they're not deists. So we have many, many similarities. You know, so there's a lot of things you don't have to teach someone who is a Roman Catholic. Usually with a Roman Catholic, you have to try to you know, get them to accept that the, the uh, sole authority in religious matters, as far as Christianity is concerned, is the Bible. Right? And show them scriptures that teach that idea. But we'll get to that. And, uh, we'll get to that. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Bible facts. A couple of questions were the kind that needed an explanation of facts and figures in the Bible, less about ideas, less about doctrines. And then miscellaneous. There are always questions that don't fit any category. You know, why are there so many religions in the, uh, in the world? Or which version of the Bible is the best? You know, so those you know, they don't kind of fit under doctrine or anything like that, so a lot of miscellaneous questions. So I'm going to do my best to answer all of your questions. Sometimes I'll tackle only one question per lesson, like tonight, and then other times we'll do two or three. One thing that will remain the same from class to class will be that I will answer as best as I can from the Bible and only from the Bible. I will not you know, use any other texts. All right. Church questions. I don't know how many people ask this question. Why do you, what do you answer when someone says the Church of Christ thinks that they're the only ones going to heaven? I mean, that question is asked I mean, 16 different ways, but it's always the same question. And an interesting thing about this question, I was, uh, I was watching a television one night several years ago, and I was watching the David Letterman show. You know, you, we're all familiar with David Letterman. He had a talk show late at night. And he used to do things in the audience. You know, he'd go in the audience and ask questions or play games or you know, do stuff. And, one, and usually all he asked someone was, uh, uh, you know, where do you come from? What city? You, know, so you, you can do a bit of a shout out to your city. What do you do for a living? You know, what's your name? Where do you come from? And what do you do for a living? And then you know, Letterman would kind of play with that, make jokes, whatever. So one man was there one night and uh, they were, he was doing something in the audience and this man stood up and he says, okay, what's your name? You know, I forget, Joe Smith or something like that. Where do you come from? And you know, I come from, I don't know, Montana. And he says, and what do you do? He says, I'm a minister. And I kind of perked up, you know, and I, now I'm really paying attention. And so Letterman, usually he let it go at that. You know, I'm a, I'm a hairdresser, I'm a fireman. Yeah, good for you. So he says, I'm a minister. So Letterman says, Oh, what denomination, you know? And the, the, the man said, the Church of Christ. And Letterman says, oh, you're the guys who think you're the only ones going to heaven. <laughs> I mean, I was flabbergasted. You know, you thought that this was just something that was floating around it. Letterman, of all people, you're not a religious man to begin with, but his impression of us, well, oh, you're, you're the guys who think you're the only ones going to, to heaven. Yeah, exactly. So we're not the only ones that ask that question. 
Now, there's no easy one word answer that you know, can completely answer this question because it's loaded with so many different meanings. For example, if the question means, is only the church that is in the Bible, the one spoken of by Peter, you know, the 3,000 that were baptized at Pentecost, and the church spoken of by Paul when he's addressing Corinth and Ephesus, if the question is that church there in the Bible, is that church the only one going to heaven? The answer is, well, yes. If, however, the question is, uh, does the Bible uh, teach that there is only one church and is that the only church that is going to go to heaven? The answer to that question is, well, yes. Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 4 that there is only one body, the church, and only one body that belongs to Christ and only the body of Christ is going to be saved. I mean, it's very clear in the New Testament. As opposed to the body of Buddha, or the body of Muhammad, or the body of Krishna. So it's not what the quote religious leaders teach, it's what the Bible teaches. Very clear, and I've said this before, a person doesn't have to believe it. You're free not to believe that. You're free to reject that if you wish. You're free to laugh at it and just you know, deep six it if you wish. The thing that you cannot do is you cannot say that the Bible doesn't teach that only the church is going to heaven. You don't have to accept it, but you have to acknowledge that that's what the Bible teaches. So we're not in trouble as far as if you're saying, you know, does the Bible teach that only the, the, the body of Christ is the only one that's going to be saved? Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what the Bible teaches. But this question doesn't usually refer to what the Bible says about the church. It is a response to a certain aggressive attitude that existed in the churches of Christ in the past, and even among some today, that said the following. Among those who call Jesus the Christ, among those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, only those among the churches of Christ will go to heaven. That's what that question is aiming at. So the conclusion drawn from this position was that, well, if you were a Baptist or you were a Methodist or a Catholic or whatever, quote, Christian group other than the Church of Christ, you were lost. You are lost. That's what that question is asking. And I know this is a, you know, I told you, <laughs> we're going to tackle some tough ones in here and this is the toughest one. Because you can't just come back and just a, a one word answer. One scripture, boom, that's it. Wouldn't it be nice? Ephesians 4.4, 4, there's only one body. Okay, next question. Well, that's not what they're asking. So this position was offensive and it was hard to take. And it spawned the question and attitude toward churches of Christ by other groups who were also calling themselves Christians. And we're also trying to serve the Lord you know, sincerely. Remember I said one of the key things in a Bible study with someone, you have to accept that they are sincere about their beliefs just as you are sincere about your beliefs. So when this thing came up, only the people who call on Jesus who belong to the Church of Christ group, only those believers are going to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. So the problem here is that the people in the churches of Christ who promoted this idea, they broke all the rules of engagement in discussing their faith with other people. First, they were not respectful 
of others' sincere belief in Jesus, like people who are Baptists or Catholics. You know, <laughs> where I come from, in, in Quebec, Montreal, you know, French Canada, when I went to school, in grade school, here in, in, in America, in the 50s, let's say, the heroes, who were the heroes? Well, they were the pioneers, right? Or George Washington, or you know, these, these people were the heroes of history. A little different now, we won't get into the political correctness that's going on today, but I think most of you understand the heroes that were taught back in the day, in the 50s. When I went to school in Canada, you know who the heroes were that they taught us? The Catholic missionaries. The Catholic missionaries that came from France, who came to Quebec and tried to convert the, well, we don't call them Native Americans. In, in Canada, we call them First Nations, but it's the same thing. They try to convert the Indians. And many of them lost their lives. They were burned at the stake. They were you know, scalped. They were killed. You know, the brothers, you know, missionary brothers, sisters, nuns that came. It was the nuns that established the first hospitals in Quebec, that ran the hospitals. It was the Catholic Church that ran all the orphanages, all the hospitals, all the social services up until about 1960 were all done and run through uh, the Catholic Church. The nurses were Catholic. The, you know. So if you're having a study with a Catholic person, and you say to them, oh yeah, yeah, you people are going to hell. <laughs> Could you imagine how offensive it is? And so they openly criticized and ridiculed other religious groups and accused them of ignorance and being insincere. I mean, I know I was on the receiving end of some of this. They used public debates and books and periodicals to denounce the doctrines of other uh, believing groups. And most of their doctrinal points were correct. Hey, they were correct. Is baptism by immersion? You bet it is. How, we can prove it. We can prove it you know, linguistically, historically, contextually, in the Greek. In the, you know, we can prove it 50 ways till Sunday. We were correct. It was the attitude that was so you know, difficult. So most of the doctrinal points that were being made were correct. The biblical arguments were accurate, but the spirit was arrogant and combative. And so they won the battle, but lost the war and gained a reputation which has crystallized by this phrase. Oh, oh, the Church of Christ, you think you're the only ones going to heaven. How do you think you get a reputation like that? So this phrase then is not a question. It's a summary statement of our mistaken approach in the past and it's a put down at the same time. When somebody says that to you, I'm just cluing you in, you're being insulted. <laughs> it's not a nice thing to say that to us. We also broke Rule number two in reaching out to others, instead of keeping the discussion based strictly on what the Bible taught on various issues of salvation, many times we made it personal. It became the Church of Christ versus the Baptist, the Church of Christ versus Roman Catholics, the Church of Christ doctrine versus the Methodist doctrine. You know, there was a time when we addressed, uh, when we adhered uh, to the motto that said, we speak where the Bible speaks, and we are silent where the Bible is silent. That, that was a great <laughs> way to approach things. Speak where the Bible speaks, silent where the Bible is silent. We forgot that piece of wisdom, and we began battling others, pitting the Church of Christ against all comers, and we gained the reputation for it. Again, we won the arguments. Why? Because we were the Bible people. We knew the book. But the attitude, oof, the attitude had a, you know, had a lot to, uh, to do with, with getting this reputation. And also we were impatient. I'm not saying everybody, you, you understand that. 
I'm just saying, you know, to, to arrive at a point where a, 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 a comedian on a late night talk show in New York City randomly picks out of the air this thought when he hears the Church of Christ must mean that, yeah, this thing has absorbed into the, the subconsciousness of the, uh, of the public. So we were also impatient to convert others, thinking that intellectual conversion was the same thing as the conversion of the spirit and of the heart. We began breaking the gospel down into a formula that could be explained and memorized in five easy steps. I, I, how many times have I heard people say this? Preach it even. Here's the gospel, here's the gospel. You hear the good news, you believe the good news, you repent of your sins, you confess Christ, and then you're baptized. There you go, I've just preached the gospel to you. Have you really? If people got this information and they understood it in our way of thinking, but they didn't follow through right away with baptism, well, we just discarded them and we moved on. The problem was that we preached the, the formula for the response to the gospel as the actual message itself. That we hear the gospel and that we believe it and that we repent of our sins and that we confess Christ and that we are baptized, we are immersed in water in the name of Jesus, okay? That is the response to the gospel. That is not the gospel. If all you've done is explain the five steps, you have not preached the gospel to that person. You've only, you've given him, you've given that person how they are to respond to the gospel. The plan of salvation, the plan of salvation was that God sent his son to die for the sins of man and thus offer us Forgiveness based on faith, not works. The response of faith was expressed, how? Through repentance, confession, and baptism. What's God's plan of salvation? His plan is, I'm going to save you, not through a system of works, I'm going to save you through a system of faith. That's the good news. You could never, ever be good enough to be saved. You could never do enough works to justify your salvation. So here, what God says, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to send my son to pay the moral debt for your sins, all of them, and you will receive forgiveness if you believe and trust in my son. And the way that you are to express that faith in Him, you will repent of your sins and be baptized. Okay, there you have the gospel and the response to the gospel. But what we were doing was we were just given the response to the gospel. Not always, but I saw a billboard with that. I saw a billboard with that. Spent a lot of money on that billboard and it was Here's how to be saved, one, two, three, four, five. Never mention Jesus, never mention the cross, never mention the grace, faith, nothing. Just do these five things, bang, you're saved. And then, to make matters worse, we practiced a scorched earth policy of evangelism which reached its zenith with the Crossroads Boston International Church Movement that gave us some more bad publicity. Some of you may not be familiar with that. They were the ones in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, they would infiltrate and divide churches in order to take them over. They were the natural outcome of this brash attitude of only we are saved mentality because they taught that if you weren't part of their discipleship movement, you were not safe. So, so the irony of it is, so we've, we've done this thing, you know, we've done this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, aggressive evangelism, you know, fighting with everybody, we're the only ones saved, and then comes along 
these young college students who form a church and whose only goal is to baptize people. That's it, that's all they do, baptize people. And they are super good at it. They are super good at arguing and debating. And I mean, they're like, the, they're like storm troopers. They're evangelical storm, evangelistic rather, storm troopers. And their churches are growing in size and they would go into a church. I know, they came to Montreal. They would go into a church like this, everything would be fine. Then all of a sudden they'd be saying, how many people have you baptized this year? To a member, not to, to how many people, how many people you baptized? Well, I, I haven't baptized any. Well, do you think you're a good Christian? Well, I, I, I thought I was, you know. Well, exactly how were you baptized? And what were you, in other words, they begin to make people doubt their own salvation. And there would be division and, and then they would kind of you know, gather up a, a group, usually the young people, and pull them out, start a church, and away we go. And so the, the, the irony of it is a group within the Church of Christ began to tell members of the Church of Christ, you people are not saved unless you're part of our group. I mean, I had somebody say that to me after like 20 years of ministry, <laughs> try that bit on me to make me think, oh, I, I'm not really saved and I'm not really part of the church. You know, well, you know, that didn't go far. So what goes around came around to us. And thankfully, thankfully, we survived it. That group repented, public repentance, and tried to fix things, but not after so many churches were hurt and so many people, their faith was damaged and our reputation was damaged. I'm not saying the Church of Christ has a bad reputation everywhere. We have a good reputation, but we're known as the Bible people. Well, after a while, you couldn't get a Church of Christ um, campus minister to work on a campus because the, the universities were afraid of this group because they caused so many, tr so many problems on different campuses. So that's some of the history and background behind this question. Don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking the church. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to, to, to you know, smear our reputation. I'm just trying to explain, how did we get here? How did people get this idea of us? Well, this is how they got this idea of us, okay? At least now you know where the question is coming from. So how do we, how do we answer? Well, depending on the circumstances, you know, whether you have a lot of time or whether the person asking has some biblical knowledge, there are several ways to respond to, you're the church who thinks you're the only ones going to heaven. Okay, how do you respond? Number one, no. We believe that the only the church described in the Bible is the one going to heaven with Jesus. That's what we believe. We believe that only the church that is described in the Bible, that's the one that is going to be saved. 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and who are they? The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Has he described 15 different groups here? No, no. The Christians who are dead and the Christians who are alive when he comes, those will be together and those will be saved. He doesn't mention 15 different groups, just one group, the ones who are alive and the ones who are dead will be joined together to be with him forever in the air. This is what the Bible teaches, and I believe what the Bible teaches. So that's the first part of my answer. Number two, only Christians are going to heaven because only Christians are saved. That's Acts chapter four, verse 12. Peter says, and they're in salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I mean, 
Can you twist this to mean that somebody other than Christians can be saved? Is there any grammar trick that you can use to contort this verse, to make it mean that not only Christians will be saved, but Buddhists will be saved, and Hindus will be saved, and, and Muslims who are nice people will be saved, or people who don't believe in God, but are fine, upstanding citizens, they'll be saved. I mean, and there is salvation in no one else. Kind of eliminates everybody, doesn't it? Again, you don't have to believe that. You don't have to live your life according to this. But what you cannot do is say that this here is teaching that everybody will be saved or all religions are all as good as, uh, you know, everyone is good as uh, another. No, no, it says there's only one name by which we can be saved. And of course, it's Jesus. I mean, if you read the verse before and after you see it, it's Jesus. I remember uh, having a Bible study with a, a, a couple that lived near our house when we were in Montreal. They invited us for supper. I think our kids played together. I think it was one of Julia's friends. And we went over and what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a minister. Oh boy, I tell you, here we go. The minute they knew that I was a minister, you know, we couldn't just have coffee. And, uh, no, 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 we got into it. Church, and then Church of Christ. Well, in Montreal, it's not like the Bible Belt. Church of Christ, what is that? You know, I explained it. And so the guy, of course, he was going to teach me now. You know, he, was, he was an engineer, but he was going to teach me the Bible. Okay, sure, go ahead and try. You know, and he asked me a question. All of a sudden, you know, I, I, I brought him to this verse. You know, and he read it. And he says, wait a minute now. Are you saying that the millions of Buddhists that live in this world are lost? And I said, uh, yeah. And I mean, he was aghast. How can you say that, he said to me. I said, I didn't say that. I'm just telling you that's what this says. And he looked at it again. And so there was only two ways for him to go. He, could, he wasn't mad at me. I was just pointing him to the book. Only two ways to go for him. He was either going to reject it or accept it. And he rejected it. He says, well, I just, uh, that's not what we believe in our church. Okay. And somehow, somehow the evening was over. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, where do you go after that? More coffee, anyone? No, I'll have a gin and tonic, please. Oh my goodness. I didn't have a gin and tonic. <laughs> So in the churches of Christ, we do not say that we're the only Christians. What we say is that we only want to be Christians according to the Bible. That's all I want. I just want to be. You know the kind of Christian they describe here? That's the kind of Christian I want to be. And we'll let God decide in the end. He'll decide if I made it or not. Not you, you're not going to decide for me. I'm not even going to decide for me. I'll let him decide for me. So we know that Christians are going to heaven. And that's what we are striving to be, Christians. Nothing more, nothing less. Why? Because the Bible says, and there is salvation in no one else. And we believe that. It's not that we have anything against our Buddhist friends and our, our, our uh, you know, other religions. Uh, you know, we're not against them. We're not, we're not wanting harm or suffering for them. I'm not responsible for their souls. I'm just responsible for my soul. Now I'm responsible for trying to preach to them. Okay, fine. But in the end, I, I'm not responsible for the yes or no of their soul. I'm just responsible for the yes or no of my soul. Number three, the Bible teaches that not all who call themselves Christians will be saved. This is where we get into sticky you know, situation. Matthew 7, 21, not, this is Jesus speaking. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Stop there. Do you mean to say that Jesus here is saying that not everybody who claims to believe in Him will go to heaven? Well, yeah, that's exactly what He's saying. What does He say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. You don't call Him Lord, Lord if you don't you know, believe in Him. Well, He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I didn't say that. The Church of Christ didn't say that. Jesus said that. So go beat me up if I'm, you know, if I'm clarifying the passage for you. But I didn't write the passage, I'm just trying to explain it. And then what does Jesus say? But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Well, where is the will of the Father located? Right here. Many, he said, will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Whoa, prophecy? You mean even preachers not going to get in? Some preachers are not going to get in? Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? You know how many people think that because they speak in tongues, they're guaranteed entry into heaven? Do you know why it's so difficult to, to convert or to, 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 to teach you know, more perfectly a person who's caught up in the charismatic movement? Because the charismatic movement teaches that the, um, the proof of your salvation is the fact that you can speak in tongues. So when you come along and say, yeah, I see what you're doing, yeah, that's not speaking in tongues. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's not speaking in tongues. What do you mean? You show them, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in another thing. They, they, they can't let that thing go, why? Because it's their crutch. Every time they're not sure, you know, uh, am I saved or not, instead of looking in the Bible to find assurance, no, they go, you know, oh yeah, I can still do that, I'm saved. I mean, it's diabolic. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The Bible itself, Jesus himself says that there will be some who call themselves Christians, those who will do great things in his name from miracles to various ministries. Those who will prophesy or preach in his name who will not enter the kingdom. He said that. And why will they not enter? Because they don't obey the will of the Father, which is contained in Jesus' word. What does he say? I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. John chapter 8, verse 28. And then in John 12, 50, he says, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So where is the will of the Father? Well, they're in the words and teachings of Jesus. And what did Jesus say? After He gives the commission to go and preach the gospel and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the believe, what does He say? Teaching them, who's to the them, the new converts, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo, I'm with you always till the end of the age. The task of the Christian is to obey all things that Jesus has taught and teach others to do the same. You know, religion in His name not done according to His will and word will not be blessed or accepted. That's the hard lesson. The hard lesson is there are sincere people who sincerely believe, but who are not obeying what Jesus taught. That's a very hard teaching. You know how, you know when Jesus said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, you know, or you can't be with me, and, and oh, you know, the, Bible, the, the, the gospel writer said after, that was a hard saying. The people said to him, that's a hard saying. And many of them you know, didn't follow him after that. Oh, well, you're, you've gone a step too far here. Well, you know what? This right here, this is a hard saying. This lesson here tonight, this is a hard lesson. Why? 
because it, 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 it puts a line in the sand. And in our country, we don't believe anymore in lines in the sand. We believe everybody's okay on their terms, whatever you want, anything goes, let's go, Everybody, everybody's invited to the party. Well, no, it doesn't work like that, unfortunately. I mean, you know, it's like I say, it'd be a lot easier to preach the gospel if you could say, you know what, believe whatever you want. As long as you're a nice person, we're all going to go to heaven. Well, yeah, sure, no. And you know why that doesn't work? I'm deviating from the notes. That doesn't work because we have no idea how sinful we are. We have no idea the depth of our depravity. We have no idea. That's why just be nice and you'll be okay. That's why we need the cross of Christ. I think the worst thing at judgment is when we step up thinking, yeah, I'm good, I've been a nice person, you know, I never killed anybody, I've been a faithful wife, husband, whatever. And then we come before God and realize the depth of our sinfulness. That's why the Son of God had to die on a cross for us. There was no other way. There is no other way. So in the end, who is a Christian and who is not? Who is saved and who is not? Who is going to heaven and who is not? Is all based on God's word. Not on what churches of Christ say or what any other group says. One more. Jesus himself says, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. What does he say? The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. You know, you want to know what's on the final exam? It's right here. And so to summarize, when someone says, oh, you're the church that thinks the only one's going to heaven, I begin by apologizing. I apologize for the person or the persons who gave you this false impression. That's never been what the churches of Christ have ever been about, never. I then inform them that God's word is the final judge of who will go to heaven and who will not. And if you want to study, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your religion or your ideas or your church and we're going to compare them to God's word. Not to the church of Christ's you know, traditions or whatever we do. No, no, no. We're going to take what you've got and we're going to compare it to God's word. And that, that's how our discussion will proceed. Number three, in addition to this, I'll assure them that in the church of Christ, our number one priority is to search the scriptures carefully to make sure that we are understanding and obeying as closely as possible the things that Christ taught. And you might put in brackets there, that's why we have Bible study Sunday morning at 9.30 and a sermon lesson at 10.30 and another Bible lesson at 5 p.m. and another Bible lesson at seven o'clock on Wednesday night and devos, that's why. That's why we do this. And finally, I ask them if there is any question or subject they'd like to study the Bible about and see if I can invite them to Bible school and worship. Remember, respect the person, stick to the Bible, be persistent. This brings me to a, one more important point I want to make before we go on answering other questions. Every question will always be answered with the same approach. One more slide here. We're going to put it into context, the issue, the doctrine, the church, the salvation, and then that question will be answered according to what I believe the Bible teaches about that particular topic. That's how this class is going to run. Okay, now we're done. Thank you very much.